Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? You ready for church? Yes, I am excited to be with you. Welcome to Highland Heights. If you are new to Highland Heights, we are glad you're here. Thanks for saying yes to the invite, however that looks. Maybe you were driving by, a coworker invited you, you saw us online, whatever that is. Thanks for saying yes to the invite. We're glad you're here this morning. Hey, we're going to ask if you would do us a favor also. If you would fill out the Connect card, which is in the back of the seat in front of you, there's a QR code. And it'll take you to a website. It's just got a few simple questions on there. It allows us to reach out to you this week and find out about your experience here this morning, but also how we can get you connected in the days ahead here at Highland Heights. We've got uh, a couple of ways that you're able to give to support the mission here at Highland Heights. Um, one of the easiest ways to participate in what God is doing here is by uh, helping to support us generously. Um, it really goes to support not just, you know, the things that are happening on a Sunday morning, but even things like our, our two missions trips that are going on right now. And so we're going to get a chance to pray for those later today. Uh, but you can give in the boxes at the doors on the left and the right here or up at the top of the sanctuary as well as by visiting hhbc.net slash give or texting in using our app. Lots of different options there that you're able to do. Two quick announcements for you today. One, we've got an Israel trip interest meeting that's happening after the service. So if you've ever thought like, man, I'd love to see the places where, uh, you know, Jesus walked, right? Where, where the Bible is, is, is talking about all those things that might bring the scriptures to life for you. Uh, this is the place to be, right? Go to this Israel interest meeting uh, uh, after our service. It's in room 208, which is just right at the top of the stairs, and you can walk down the hallway a little bit and see it on the left. Uh, we're going to be heading there, I believe, next year in the summer, right? And so uh, I'm really excited about that opportunity. I think it's really valuable and meaningful for our church um, so that we can continue to be people who are, are focused on the Word of God, focused on the gospel, uh, seeing how that comes to life. Uh, and the last thing to share with you is that VBS is coming up really soon. And so we've got, I think I heard over 260 kids signed up already, which is really awesome. So this is pretty early. So over 260 Actually, kids. 389. Oh, are you serious? You yes, just heard that. 389. 389 already. So you don't want to miss out on this opportunity. One, to bring your kids so that they can hear the gospel uh, and get connected with other people from our community, but two, to participate and serve as well uh, in a chance for us to just see so many new people from our community uh, get connected not only to the church, but to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're super thankful for those opportunities coming up in the days ahead. Yes. Thanks, Jackson. Also, I want to share with you something exciting this morning. So a few months ago, I don't know exactly how many months ago, but it's been a few, and we can share the story at a later date, but there's a group of people within the Highland Heights Worship Ministry who have been writing songs. And uh, today, we are going to start the service with our very first song that we've written and completed. So all the tracks and the arrangements and everything going on, we are super excited about what God has been doing in this group of people and how they've come together to write songs, as we like to say, by the church and for the church. So this morning, if you would stand up with us, we're going to teach you a new song simply titled, Be Glorified.
right. Amen.
is greater. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer this morning. And so if you'd like to, as I read this passage of scripture, you're welcome to come forward to the altar. Um, We've got a unique opportunity today to be in prayer, not just for the things that are happening here and the things that are happening in our lives um, and even in our community, but uh, our church has sent two teams of missionaries um, out on some short-term trips. And so we've got a team that's in Brazil right now, and we've got a team that's in Pittsburgh right now, both working with some churches, working uh, to get the gospel to people who are lost and in desperate need. And so one of my favorite passages of scripture that speaks to uh, really a heart for lost people Uh, and what the work that's being done is um, as these teams go out uh, is in Romans chapter 10. And so this is Paul as he's uh, essentially writing about his concern and his care for his own people, for the people of Israel, uh, that they would hear the gospel and respond. And so he says that the message is near to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. And this is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So how then can they call on him who they've not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. So we've had an opportunity to send some people with the good news this week. I wanna invite you to pray over these teams with me over the work that's being done to proclaim the gospel. Uh, But I wanna encourage you as well, uh, take this as an opportunity not just to pray for these teams, but pray for yourself. Uh, Because we're all ultimately those who are sent to carry the gospel to the world, um, whether it's in Pittsburgh or Brazil or, you know, down your street as you head home. So Father, help us to live this truth out, to be the people who carry the gospel forward Um, who proclaim the good news in such a way that people are able to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. There's nothing greater that we can give our lives to and give our time to. And so Lord, as some of the members of our church are off uh, doing this in a unique way, I think of Pittsburgh and uh, especially the many students that are there um, near and dear to my heart, um, being able to exercise ultimately their responsibility to carry the gospel forward as you've set it in their hearts, as you've placed that message upon them, as you've made them, uh, as 1 Corinthians says, ministers of reconciliation. Uh, Lord, I pray for that team that they just be charged by your spirit and empowered in such a way that they're able to carry that good news forward and see really great things happen because of your name, because of what you're doing, because of how you've equipped them and prepared them for this work. Uh, Open hearts, help people to be receptive Uh, Help them to not only experience um, a good hand from the church as uh, needs that they have are met, but also uh, a good word from your scriptures as the gospel is proclaimed. And Lord, we think of Brazil as well and and the people that are down there. God, uh, an international trip is is often burdensome, um, but Lord, we know that that burden is worth it because it allows us to Uh, be able to make an impact for your kingdom far beyond just the reaches of these walls and this community. And so I think of the many team members that we've sent on that trip as well, Uh, the churches they'll be working with, the the communities they'll be able to connect to. Lord, uh, let this unique moment uh, in those communities' lives uh, as people from Highland Heights show up and and share and encourage them, uh, participate alongside the churches that minister to them. Lord, let this be something that uh, not only is memorable, Um, but that memory sparks in them um, a shift and a change uh, that motivates them towards a gospel response long-term in their lives. Lord, we know that you do great things when people are just faithful to step out and be obedient. And we know that you've called us to obey by sharing the good news, not only in Pittsburgh and in Brazil, but day to day here at Highland Heights and in our community. And so Lord, I just pray that you continue to do great gospel work as your message is carried forward by this church. And I pray this in your name. Amen.
Would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning? I'm calling on the God Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the
God, we thank you this morning for everything that you are to us. That God, you are the God that moves the mountains in our lives, who parts the sea so that we may go on. God, we thank you for how you continue to be our provider, our healer, and our defender every single day. God, I pray as we continue with our service, would you open our ears and our hearts? May you speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I am so sincerely convinced that the church and our world is just in need of revival, a movement of God unlike any other is our hope as a people. I just want you to join me in prayer. I know we just prayed. I truly want you to join me in prayer this morning. So if you're not walking, you can bow your head. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. How many of you this morning would say your personal walk, your faith, could use a bit reviving. I just want you to raise your hand. Man, so many, so many, we are not alone. How many of you this morning are in agreement, our community, our world is in need of revival? It's like almost every hand in the room. I want to lead you in prayer this morning. It's not where I was going. But I want to lead you in a prayer this morning, just feel burdened as we sang and as we lifted our voices to the Lord. First, I want you to pray for your own heart. God, this morning, as we've worshiped, as I listen to your word, may my spirit be quickened by your spirit. May my heart be reached by your heart. May I experience your presence fresh and new in my life. May you work in me first and foremost. I want to challenge you to pray for your home. Whether you live with your family or not the people you call family. God, we send revival to our families who are in desperate need of you to work in their lives. The prodigal son or daughter who has run so far, so hard away from you. The children that are growing up who are looking to us and we fall so woefully short. God, may they see you fresh and new. May you work in their lives. May you work in our marriages. May you do what we can't do. We've declared in song, God, we need you, and you're the God who is able to do the impossible, and so, God, we lift these impossible things to you, trusting that you can accomplish it. Join me in prayer for our community. God, our community is broken. And there's moments where we look around and it feels like darkness has prevailed. And yet we come to you because your word is right and true 
and accurate when it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Father, in that same word also tells us that just as you are the light of the world, we're called to be light to this world. So work in us, work in our families, and then work through us that your light would shine in the darkness, that people would see you, they would experience your grace, that they would, as they hear your truth, and they would know your salvation in their lives as well. Father, we come to you with all these prayers, and we pray in the name of Jesus, knowing that he is able. And God's people said, amen. I think about the passage we're going to dig into today. It's Judges chapter 4, and we'll just touch on Judges chapter 5. And, and, and here is the thing that kind of stands out to me is, is this idea that we are in complete agreement. As a matter of fact, when I said, how many of you just need personal revival, a number of hands went up in the room. But when I said, how many of you believe our, our community, our world is in desperate need of revival, nearly every hand goes up in the room. And there's, there's agreement that God should, that we need revival in our community and in our world. And we understand that it's by God's sovereignty, his goodwill, that revival will come. But I think oftentimes this is kind of our prayer. God, I am in desperate need of revival, but I would like you to revive me without changing me. And Lord, our community is broken and dark, so I would like you to send someone to reach them other than me. And there's kind of a thought process that we need revival, but we're not willing to actually do and become the people that God is calling us to become, that our heart and our family and our community might actually be changed. It's the idea of, Lord, do this, just do it with someone else. I thought a little bit about the bystander effect this past week. If you're familiar with the, the bystander effect, it's basically the idea that the house is on fire and there are people that are watching the house burn to the ground. And they understand that there are, might be people inside. but they wait for somebody else to take action. There's probably some firefighters in the room today that are like, hey, that's what you're supposed to do. But it's not just with houses on fire, is it? We see brokenness all around us. We see a desperate people and we go, you know, somebody ought to do something about that. But will that somebody be us? Well, no, that would be inconvenient, uncomfortable. I'm not qualified. Certainly, somebody else ought to be the one standing in the gap. The reality is, is that the bystander effect is not just limited to physical disasters, but also to spiritual callings. God has often raised up men and women to a task, one that he's called them to do. You feel the prompting of God leading your heart and you go, no, 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 not me. Someone else will surely do it. Meanwhile, churches around our nation are shutting their doors by the hundreds. because God's people refuse to step up. The world grows increasingly darker and the lost perish. Meanwhile, we wonder where God's people 
are. Check out this text in Judges chapter 4 with me this morning. I think it speaks to the heart of a calling that God is placing upon his church. And as the prophets of old would say, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the people. Verse 1 of chapter 4. The Israelites again do what is evil in the sight of the Lord after he had died. And the Lord sold them to King Jabin of Canaan, who, re, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth of the nations. And Israel cries out to the Lord because Jabin had 900 chariots. In other words, what the Bible is describing is he had a fierce army that they could not perceive how they could possibly overcome. It was a battle that was much too big for them, and they wondered if it was much too big for God. For it says in the next line, for he, Sisera, had harshly, cruelly oppressed them, listen to this, for 20 long years. God's people were dealing with a battle, an oppression that they couldn't seem to fight their way out of. Verse 4, it says, so Deborah, the prophetess and the wife of Lapidoth was judging Israel at the time, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to settle disputes. So there's this prophetess named Deborah, and she's called a judge, appointed as a judge by God, and she's not the military leader like we often think of in the book of Judges, but she is a judge, rightly, so like we would think of judges. She judges disputes and settles arguments among the people of Israel. She's a person who is wise, not just from the Lord, but she's wise in the sight of God's people. 20 years are going by. God's people are repenting. Will God deliver? And so this is what it says in verse 6. So she summons Balak, son of Aminoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and says to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you to go? Just pause there. Hey, church. Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, called you to go? Is that not the Great Commission? Just let it set, because we'll go back to it at the end. Deborah says to Barak, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you to go deploy the troops on Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the Naphtalites and the Zebulonites? These are two of the tribes of Israel. And I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and his chariots and his infantry at Wadi Kishon to fight against you. And I will hand him over to you. And Barak says this. He doesn't say, I haven't heard God tell me that. I'm glad he's telling you that, but he hasn't told me that. No, 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 he's in complete agreement with Deborah. God has said to him that he is the one that is supposed to lead, but listen to his response. He says, well, Deborah, you know, I'm a judge, you're a judge. You know, God's told me to go. This is the Josh paraphrase, by the way. And so he says to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And Deborah responds, she says, so I will gladly go with you. But you will receive no honor on the road that you are about to take because the Lord will sell Sisera to a woman. And so Deborah got up and goes with Barak to Kadesh and Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh and 10,000 men followed him and it says at the end of verse 10, and Deborah goes with them. Throughout the rest of chapter 4, basically what happens is this. God moves in such a way that Sisera and his armies are utterly vanquished. 
His armies are dropping like flies all around him. These 900 chariots that they thought were so powerful were no match, not to God's people, but to the Lord. It says he does it. And so then you find that Sisera takes flight. He starts to run. And as he runs, he, he comes up on a Kenite household in a Kenite village, a people that he thought his king was good with. And he goes to a Kenite daughter and he says, will you hide me? She says, I'll hide you. She covers him up. He uncovers. It's like if you give a mouse a cookie, he's like, hey, can you get me a drink of water now? It's like, I got you. She actually doesn't bring him water. She brings him milk. So he's tired. Now he's feeling the weight of that milk. Sleep kind of overruns him. And JL goes out and she picks up the stake of a tent. She walks over to Sisera and she does this really ladylike thing because she drives that pick right through Sisera's head. Like, man, the Bible's got some stories. Yeah, it does. Finally, you got Barak who comes along the way and Jael's standing kind of by the doorstep. She's like, hey, you know that person that you're looking for? He's like, yeah, that person, that, that, that general that I'm looking for, I'm ready to be here. I'm ready to kill him. She's like, just come on inside. He's already dead. He's underneath those covers. And honor was gone. Throughout the book of Judges, what we're looking at is how do we waste our lives as God's people? And when we think back over the first couple of chapters or the end of Joshua, and as we've gotten into the book of Judges, we've seen the Israelites continue to waste their lives and waste the opportunities that have been given to them. As a matter of fact, when we enter into Judges chapter 4, it says that the Israelites, again, do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. They continue to not do what God had called them to do, and so they continue to waste their lives. And it all so far has centered around basically two themes. One, they let sin hang around. They refuse to be holy as God is holy. By the way, that's not just a charge in the Old Testament. That's a charge that Peter gives the church in the New Testament. I think about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Does sin so easily ensnare the church? You bet. He says, get rid of it. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. They fail to get rid of the sin in their lives. They let sin continue to hang around, assuming that a holy God is somehow okay with that. The second thing they fail to do is they fail to fully train the next generation in the Shema. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart and you're to repeat them to your children. He says, what I am telling you, you pass on to the next generation. And so they let sin hang around in their own lives and they continue to let the next generation not grow up knowing the God of Israel. And then finally today, we kind of get into a new theme. We see God's man in Barak and he's not stepping in to do what God had specifically called him to do in his life thought a lot about uh, when I was a youth and Mandy and I, we would be uh, talking about being in the center of God's will. And the way we'd speak about it is that being in the center of God's will is one of the greatest adventures a follower of Christ can truly ever experience. It's the highest of highs and it's the greatest of joys. We would say to one another, we don't just want to be in the center of God's will. We want to be in the center of the center of God's will because we understood as a follower of Jesus that that was where the action is. What's really cool is that today we celebrate our 18th anniversary and we got three boys and there's been a lot of adventures along the way and there's been ups and there's been downs. But I fully believe that that is still true for us. I don't just want to be in the center of God's will. I want to be in the center of the center of God's will. 
Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, it's now called Crew, which disciples college students across college campuses all around the United States, says this, as you love God and as you serve him, you will undoubtedly experience the greatest adventure of all. We have been created as a people with a heart which desires adventure. It's summer here, so a lot of you have vacations plans. And you really look forward to those vacations. And as other vacations pop up and your friends take vacations on Facebook or on Instagram, you go, man, oh, I wish I could be on vacation with that person. I wish I could go with this person. I wish I could do this thing. We have a heart that desires adventure. But I'm going to tell you this morning that the greatest adventure is not going on another vacation. The greatest adventure is living out the calling that God has placed on your life and on mine. And yet so many of us are stuck like Barak in debilitating fear, failing to move forward into what God has called us to do as individual followers of Jesus and as his people called the church. The first thing we see when we're looking at this passage is we see a debilitating leadership and a debilitating faith. Check out what it says in verse six again. It says, so Deborah summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh, where he was, in Naphtali, and says to him, has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you to go, to deploy the troops on Mount Tabor? And in verse eight, Barak says, if you'll go with me, then I'll go too. But if you're not going to go with me, I'm not going to go. Basically, Barak offers up an excuse to Deborah. Check this out. God had called Barak to be a judge. We understand that already from the passage. And God had called Barak to lead Israel's army. We understand that he's the commander of the army in this passage. We understand that God had called Barak to set Israel free from the wicked and cruel rule of King Jabin and General Sisera. So this is a pretty exciting appointment. If you're a person of God, like this is a cr pretty incredible opportunity. And so you can picture Deborah's confusion because she's looking around and she's waiting on Barak to take charge. She's waiting for the trumpet to sound and she's just listening to the crickets because he was nowhere to be found. He's MIA. He's hiding out somewhere. He's hoping God will choose again. He's hoping that God will choose someone else, anyone else to do what God had specifically called him to do. Reminds me a bit of Moses. Sees the burning bush in the wilderness. He says, I think I'll check that out. He walks up. God says, I'm calling you, Moses. Go back to Egypt. Lead the people out of Egypt. Moses is like, you got the wrong dude. See, there's a number of reasons that we can become crippled from stepping into the great adventure and callings that God has for us. I think it boils down to at least three Number one, we don't want to be inconvenienced because we understand that if we step into God's calling for our life, it's going to cost us something. If we step into God's calling for our life, I'm going to be inconvenienced. It's going to cost me time that I would rather spend elsewhere. If I step into God's calling for my life, it's going to cost me financially. I'm going to be asked to give in a way that I don't want to give because I like having a certain number of things or cushion in my budget or my budget is maxed out and I can't imagine how if I gave, I would possibly have enough. But it's God who provides. Can I tell you something that's just truth for you as God's people, it's true for me as a follower of Jesus. I am not the provider for my family. God is. Therefore, it is not my money. It's God's to begin with. 
And therefore, when I'm faithful to do what God has called me to do, he is faithful to me and to return. You cannot give God. We don't want to be inconvenienced. It might cost us our time. We don't want to be inconvenienced. It might cost us financially. We don't want to be inconvenienced because if I say yes to God, if my yes is truly on the table, he might call me to do something crazy like go to Africa. We'll do a mission trip there next year, all right? He might call me to be inconvenienced where I don't feel safe and secure. Or he might call me to be inconvenienced where I have to go to this person over here that does not look like me, doesn't talk like me, and I'm not sure I like very much. And I don't want that. I don't want to be inconvenienced. The second thing that sometimes cripples us from truly stepping into God's calling on our life is the fear of failure. God, I'm not good enough. God, I don't speak well enough. God, I don't know enough scripture. It's really interesting because around the church, we have often used the cliche, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. How many of y'all have heard that before? Somewhere and just like heard that before. I like it because I think cliches are cliche for a reason. Because there's truth in them. Because if serving God rested on your abilities or on my abilities, none of us are qualified. But thank God, it's not about us. It's about him. His power made perfect in our weakness that the gospel would go forward. We say we desire that, but fear overwhelms us. And the third one is doubt. Sometimes that doubt is akin to guilt or shame. And doubt becomes this voice in our head that nags us and calls into question what God has already made clear through his spirit and through his word and through others. Did God really call you to do that? Isn't there someone better? Yes, there probably is. But yes, he also called you, so go. Church, I want you to know there's never been a time in my life where I have stepped into a new assignment when at least one, if not every single one of these things were not working against my mind and my heart and my spirit. Are you sure? Did God really call you to pastor this really awesome church called Highland Heights? Can you really do that? No, by the way, the answer is no, I can't. But God can. And he can use broken vessels like me, like Tim, like Brian, like Jackson, and Butch over there, so many other staff, Sean, you know, all of our leaders. He can use them, he can use me, he can use you too. One of my favorite evangelists is a guy by the name of D.L. Moody. He was an evangelist in Chicago. And one of the quotes he heard from another preacher that simply changed his life, one of those defining moments in D.L. Moody's life was this. He heard this quote, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man who is fully consecrated to him. And D.L. Moody resolved by God's help, I aim to be that man. See, convenience and fear and doubt are all man-centered. They're me-centered. When we walk according to convenience, fear, and doubt, we will only ever get what man can do. But if we walk by faith, we will experience what God can do. And when we look at the passage here, the really funny conclusion in all of this is for our judge, Barak, and for God, or for us, rather, God sees through our excuses. He sees through Barak's excuses and Barak is thrust onto the battlefield in spite of his best efforts not to be. In other words, you can dodge God all you want. But if God has something for you to do, he will most often find a way for you to do it. 
Barak still had to face his fears. But in the midst of that, he would miss out on being blessed and used by God in the way that God had said he would. The second thing we see in this passage is we see a loss of honor. In chapter four, verse nine, it says this. This is the way that Deborah responds to Barak. She says, I will gladly go with you, but you will receive no honor on the road that you're about to take because the Lord will sell Sisera to a woman. And so Deborah got up and she goes out with Barak to Kadesh. So God tells Barak, people are not going to honor you, but they're going to honor someone else. And I don't want to mix up these biblical contexts. So just to be clear, glory belongs to God. Glory is that praise and reverence that is only due to him in absolutely every situation. But honor can be different. While honor should be to God, we also honor others who lead and live well. We honor moms on Mother's Day, and we honor dads on Father's Day, and we honor veterans on Veterans Day. So honor is set aside from glory. Honor can be for a person who is living well, living rightly before man and before God, and glory is something that belongs to God only. So honor is defined this way, honesty, fairness, and integrity in one's beliefs and actions. It is a reflection of a person's character. And what you're hearing from Deborah is that you're not really following God. You're living in fear. You're not really walking by faith. And because of that, while you're going to lead these people out into battle, and while you're still going to do this thing that God has told you you're going to do, there's not going to be honor in it, and you're going to lose honor. As a matter of fact, Barak loses honor in this text, not once, but twice. First, he loses honor because Deborah has to call him out and call him to action. He clearly knew what he was supposed to do, but he was shirking the responsibility of who he was supposed to be, who God had called him to be. James chapter four, verse 17 says this, so it is sin to know the good and yet not to do it. Did you catch that? It's sin for us as God's people to know what God has called us to do and to not do it. Let me put it to you this way. It is just as much sin for us as God's people to know what God has called us to do and to not do it as the sins that we so often are grieved by when we look out into the world. A sinful world is not going to be revived It's not going to be brought to life by a sinful and dead church who refuses to walk by faith and to do what God has called her to do. It's sin to know good and yet not to do it. A person whom God has called, in our text, this is this judge, Barak, and military leader, should not need anyone to call him to action other than God. The second way that Barak loses honor is in the death of Sisera. I kind of think it must have played out like this, and at least this is my imagination. Maybe Barak thought once he was out there fighting and seeing all the troops fall and Sisera flee that he would still get honored when the victory celebration came. Or maybe Barak thought that Deborah, I mean, she's a prophetess, she's pretty cool. She judges Israel, helps us out too. Maybe she would get the honor and that would at least make some sense. But here is what God brings to light. It is the least likely scenario that Barak probably could have ever imagined. It's as if God were saying to Barak, you thought that you, a man, an Israelite, a military leader, and a judge were too weak to bring down Sisera. But check this out. I have used a woman, a Kenite, not an Israelite, who's not a military leader. She's a homemaker. Literally, the women that were a part of the Kenites, what they did as they moved from place to place, because they were a little bit more of a nomadic people, they set up tents. And it was the woman's responsibility to set up the tent. At least she knew how to use a tent peg, right? She uses this person. 
or he uses rather this person to bring down Sisera. Because Barak, the person who should have been strong, the person who should have walked with God, refused to do it. And here's the cool thing as if for us as a church, we're reminded in this passage that God loves using the unexpected. When we feel like God can't use us, we're in the perfect place for God to use us in amazing ways. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. It says, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. And this isn't really that kind of Paul, by the way. He says, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise from a human perspective. He says, hey, you guys, y'all were a bunch of fools. Nobody was seeking wisdom from you. Nobody was going to you for advice. Not many of you were powerful or prominent or of noble birth in your community. Nobody was looking at you thinking you had everything together. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. That's us as followers of Jesus. What is viewed as nothing, that's us as followers of Jesus. To bring about that which is viewed as something, which is the Lord and our gospel. So that we don't boast in his presence. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. The great and mighty Sisera is killed not by a military leader with a sword, but by a woman with a tent peg. And Barak fails to step into God's calling. He lets convenience, fear, and doubt control his life. And so the judge and military leader of Israel is without honor. And I want you to see how all of this ends. If you have time, go ahead and read chapter 5, because it's Deborah's song after everything is done. But in verse 2, it says this. When the leaders lead in Israel and when the people volunteer or serve, blessed be the Lord. That hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm just being honest with you. When the leaders lead in the church, when the body of Christ rises up and serves, blessed be the Lord. The Lord's name is blessed and God's people are blessed as a result. Barak misses the blessing of God and he misses God's blessing in his life. When we fail to step into God's calling in our lives, when we fail to follow God's leadership in our lives, when convenience, fear, and doubt control our minds, heart, and actions, we miss out on blessing God, bringing glory to him, and we miss out on receiving the blessings from God that he desires to pour out on us. I love this quote from another pastor. He says, stop looking for the path of least resistance. Stop looking for convenience. Stop looking for the path of least resistance. Stop looking and worrying about fear and what could possibly come. Stop looking at the path of least resistance. Stop letting doubt overrun you that you're not good enough. Stop looking for the path of least resistance. Start running, sprinting down the path of greatest glory to God and good to others because that is what Jesus has done and that is what God's people are called to do. You might say this morning, I am not called to be a pastor and I am not called, Josh, to be a missionary and I sincerely doubt, Josh, I'm called to be a life group leader or whatever else. So how can you say that I am a person who is called by God? First Corinthians opens up with this. Verses two and three, it says, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, Jesus, called as saints. So to the church who is called, you said, well, that was the Corinth, wait for it with all those in every place who, are call, who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are called from sin, from shame, from death, and you are called to something, new life and new purpose, glorifying God and sharing Jesus. 
So what do we do with this? I think there's four ways we can see that we're not to waste our life when we look at this judge, Barak. The first one is this. We are called as saints to grow in our faith, our relationship with God. Check this out, church. We cannot experience the greatest adventure glorifying God and making a lasting difference in our world without a real and vibrant relationship with the Savior. Here's what I want to say. If you've heard this morning that there is a great adventure waiting for you, and yet you do not first have a relationship with God through Jesus the Son, having trusted by faith his work on the cross to die for your sin and his resurrection from the grave, which is his promise of eternal life for you. If you haven't trusted Jesus, there is no greatest adventure because that's where the adventure begins. But for you as a believer, for you as a believer, we will not experience revival. And we will not experience the adventure that God has called us to if we are not experiencing vibrant relationship with the Savior. I want to say it this way. A dead world cannot be awakened by a dead church. We must first be right with God. The second way we can waste our life is if we don't grow in our testimony, which is walking rightly before God and others. If we're not walking by faith, how could God honor our lives? If we're still living a life that is controlled by sin, how would God bless that? He would not be holy if he did. We must learn to be a people who are growing in our testimony, walking rightly before God and others. Number three, we ought to be people who are growing in our service. Serving God and meeting the needs of others. You're like, I am ready to serve. Great. I have a job for you. You can walk right up those stairs. There's a big poster board that's at the top of the stairs because we have VBS coming up and we need like 30 to 40 people to sign up to serve at VBS. Some of you are like, that's working with kids. Not necessarily. Some of you need to step into the kitchen and help make some food and prepare snacks and do those type of things. Some of you can come hang out with me in the parking lot and make sure that the cars and the traffic are flowing in the right direction. Some of you can come and help assistant, assist teachers or help in a number of other ways, but we need you to serve. He said, I haven't been asked to serve. I'm asking now. So if you would like to sign up for VBS, you can walk up the stairs and serve. If you're like, hey, I will serve, but it's not VBS. There is like six or seven. I will serve cards that are right next to that. Fill one of those out. We would love to connect you to a way to serve in our church. We need to grow in our service, serving God and meeting the needs of others. And finally, we ought to grow in our witness, sharing the gospel with others so that they might know him too. When I'm looking at this passage, I got to tell you, there were a number of things that hit me, but I, one of them that certainly has weighed on my heart is this, has not the Lord, the God of Israel commanded you to go? Church, has he not commanded you to go? Church, has he not commanded you to go? Hey, church, has he not commanded you to go? Then we are wasting our lives like Barak if we do anything less. And we are missing out on God's honor and blessing in our lives. Let us be people who grow in him. Let us be people who walk with him. Let us be people who serve him and others. And let us be people who go and share him with a world that needs to know him. If we are this, I believe that revival that we all raised our hands for at the beginning will not only come to us, will not only come to our households, will not only be experienced by our church, but will be seen in our community and our world as well. 
Father God, in the next few moments as we enter into a time of invitation, I pray that we would each consider how we might be wasting our lives, not stepping into the calling that you're leading us into. Father, we, we not be a people who are crippled by our own insecurities. May we not compromise through fear and doubt. May we not consider the cost. May we lay our hearts and our lives before you and say, God, do with me as you will. Like Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Father, if there's one that doesn't know you today, may they step forward and to trust you. May they know that you love them deeply, so much so that you sent the son Jesus for them to die that gruesome death on the cross on their behalf. May they trust you today and begin that great adventure that only happens when we experience life in you. Father, in the moments that we have here, may your church respond. Continue to work in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, whether it's standing and singing, whether it's coming and praying with a prayer partner up front, maybe it's getting up and not just leaving to head to your car, but leave through that back door and signing up for VBS. I want to challenge you to respond to God's word this morning.
saints and the angels in this, proclaiming the name Jesus, only Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, it has been a great morning in the house of the Lord. And uh, Pastor Josh, that comment, a dead church cannot reach a dying world. Man, that's convicting right there. And I hope this morning that you will take that as you leave and examine yourself. Where are you in your relationship with Christ? Are you making an impact in our community? And I trust that you are. Well, this morning, just a couple of reminders. Don't forget, we have the Israel uh, interest meeting right up the stairs in uh, uh, room 208 if you're interested in going to that. Also, if you're new to Highland Heights, maybe this is your first, second, or third time visiting, we're going to have a couple pastors in what we call our upper lobby, which is straight up these center stairs up top there. And then we'll have a couple pastors down front. We would love to meet with you this morning. If you filled out that Connect card, thank you for doing that. Uh, but we would love to meet you as well. Just shake your hand and thank you for being here with us this morning. And I think that's all I got, Pastor Josh. Anything else? Sounds good. That's all I got. What is our verse? We got to do our verse today, right? Thank you, Tyler. Let's go ahead and put that up there. Here we go. Let's say it all together. Ephesians 4.1. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Let's live worthy of the calling, church, this week. Have a great week.